Welcome, welcome, welcome to one and all here in the Great Hall of the New York City Bar Association and many of you that are online. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce you to what I know is going to be an endlessly fascinating program with a subject that is both historic in American history from the very origins and couldn't be more timely, which is the idea of judicial self-restraint through the prism of the life and works of a great New Yorker, Felix Frankfurter, who knew the Great Hall of the City Bar very well. Um, the idea of the program is pretty simple. What is judicial restraint? I think um, Justice Frankfurter's briefly former colleague, um, mentor, and beloved friend, Louis Brandeis, summed it up most aptly. The most important thing we do is not doing. A somewhat more provocative expression of the same idea would be Alexander Hamilton, who described the judiciary as the least dangerous branch. Today, we have the privilege of hearing about Felix Frankfurter from the Ron Chernow of judicial biographies, who hopefully will do for Frankfurter or has done, I believe you have done, what Chernow did for Hamilton. So just a few thanks, and then we'll get to the program. Uh, of course, tonight is sponsored by the Historical Society of the New York Courts, as well as the New York City Bar Association, as well as the Writers Institute of SUNY Albany, whose executive director, Paul Grondel, is here, the magnificent executive director of the Historical Society. Marilyn Marcus is here on behalf of all of us online and in the room, our deepest thanks for the work and effort to make tonight possible. So your master of ceremonies today, uh, and I will say this is, having attended over 25 years, innumerable programs of the Historical Society and other similar legal programs as an Augusta group of experts, authorities, practitioners, public servants, and academics, is at least I've had the pleasure of being a part of and listening to. Uh, the master of ceremonies, beginning with is none other than John Q. Barrett, just a word. Um, he and uh, Professor Snyder, and I can say without fear of contradiction, are among America's preeminent legal historians. John Barrett, who is no stranger and a longtime member of the Board of Historical Society, is the Benjamin Cardozo Professor of Law at St. John's. He is the Elizabeth S. Lena Fellow and a director of the Robert H. Jackson Center he is working on what we can be certain will be the definitive biography of another one of Felix Frankfurter's colleagues, Robert Jackson, and will detail not only Justice Jackson's life before and during his magnificent tenure as a justice of the Supreme Court, as well as being a Nuremberg pro prosecutor. So without further ado, allow me to introduce to you Professor John Barrett. Thank you so much, Hank, and good evening, everyone here and virtually and in the video afterlife. It's an honor to be part of the Historical Society because of its work, uh, its mining, its programming, and its education. And one of the things that it does very well is create treasures that live on and teach. And I know that particularly as a law professor. Uh, my job here at the start is a great pleasure because I get to introduce my friend, Brad Snyder. Brad is a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. He is a native of Washington, D.C., a graduate of Duke and Yale Law School, clerk for Judge Dorothy Nelson on the Ninth Circuit, briefly practiced law at Williams and Connolly. In there also before law school was a sports writer at the Baltimore Sun and in his teaching career, first at Wisconsin and now at Georgetown, has really blazed a high path of accomplishment. Uh, Brad teaches constitutional law and sports law and legal history, and he's the author of four books that are sort of in that seam. Uh, the first one is called Behind the Shadow of the Senators, which is about the Negro Leagues team in Washington, the Homestead Grays. He then authored A Well-Paid Slave, which is a book about Kurt Flood, and his fight against Major League Baseball's reserve clause. He published a book called The House of Truth, which was about the progressive salon in the Wilson era and forward in Washington, DC, one member of which was Felix Frankfurter, 
And that was just a warm up act because last year he published this definitive and the first cradle to grave comprehensive biography of Felix Frankfurter called Democratic Justice, Felix Frankfurter, the Supreme Court and the making of the liberal establishment. Uh, and a future program, Brad, right now is working on a book about Angelo Herndon, uh, a civil rights Supreme Court case, et cetera. Um, Brad will begin with the discussion biographically of Frankfurter. Uh, Frankfurter, as Hank said, is a New Yorker, was a New Yorker, is a shadow, uh, a, a star, an inspiration for the law and for this community in this place particularly. Uh, and then we will have a panel discussion about Frankfurter and some of his philosophy of judging. And I will introduce the other panelists after Brad. So for starters, it's a delight, Professor Brad Snyder. Thanks so much, Hank and John, for those um, really kind words. And I'm just really um, in awe of being here. And thanks to the team members of this panel, um, Chief Judge Littman, um, Solicitor General Underwood, Dean McKenzie, the Historical Society for the New York Courts. You know, to be in this hall um, in the New York City Bar, um, you know, I just kind of have chills doing it because um, on March, I mean, Felix is here. If you don't think he's here, he's here. Because on, on March 18th, 1947, um, Felix Frankfurter was in this hall um, delivering uh, the sixth annual Benjamin Cardozo lecture, um, which was published in the Columbia Law Review, some reflections on the reading of statutes, um, which was both on an attack on judicial lawmaking that he perceived in some of his colleagues, um, but also a still very influential guide um, to statutory interpretation. Um, that still figures in um, to some of our current debates um, about text um, versus purpose um, when interpreting a statute. A and really, like Felix's friends and life were really here at the New York City Bar. We just had a reception where there were busts and portraits, and all over the room um, were Frankfurter's friends. Um, there was um, the great um, New York Admiralty lawyer, T.C. Burlingham. Uh, there was um, his um, half-brother, half-son, um, Justice Louis Brandeis. Uh, there was Sam Rosenman, the great um, New York judge himself, and also an um, FDR um, speechwriter who was a um, longtime Frankfurter friend. And then there was um, both the Solicitor General and Judge Thomas D. Thatcher, um, whom Frankfurter worked with um, as an AUSA um, in the Southern District of New York. Um, so really, the New York... Um, city bar. Um, so much of Frankfurter's life um, was here in New York. And I want to give you some of that background before we get into the nitty gritty of his um, judicial philosophy and, um, you know, what um, his historical importance um, still is. So Frankfurter was a New Yorker. Through and through. Now, oh, there's the mic. Sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> he arrived at Ellis Island um, at age 11. Um, he had never spoken a word of English, had never heard one spoken. He arrived from Austria and he lived in a German speaking neighborhood um, in lower Manhattan, not the Lower East Side, but lower Manhattan. He lived, he and his family in an apartment building at um, 99 East 7th Street. Um, he credited his first teacher at PS 25, um, a woman named Miss Hogan with his um, quick assimilation into American culture and into learning English. Um, she threatened his German speaking classmates with corporate punish, corporal punishment um, if they spoke to him in his native German. Um, they abided by that um, edict not to speak to him in German. And so she, he gives all the credit for Miss Hogan for his rapid rise. And indeed it's, an, it's a rapid rise from age 11, not speaking a word of English um, to um, age 23 into being a, on a first name basis um, with former president Theodore Roosevelt. Let me tell you um, how he got there. Well, he didn't just learn English um, from Miss Hogan and at PS 25, he frequented the um, Ottendorfer branch of the New York Public Library um, right around the corner from his house at 155 Second Avenue. Um, he also was a regular at Cooper Union at 7 East 7th Street. Um, he would go to the top floor 
of Cooper Union and read newspapers from all over the country back when libraries had hard copies of newspapers. And um, then he would go downstairs and sit on big red leather chairs and listen to people lecture about political and social topics. And he said that he often got his um, American education at um, Cooper Union. Um, he did incredibly well um, at PS um, 25. His test scores coming out of elementary school were high enough um, that Horace Mann offered him um, a partial scholarship to go there, but his family couldn't afford um, the other half of the tuition. So Frankfurter attended um, CCNY, which um, of course was a launching pad um, for so many New Yorkers. It was a free combined um, high school um, and college program. And he finished um, third in his class at CCNY um, at, and graduated in June 1902. He is 19 years old. He spends a year working for New York City's new tenement house department, where, and he spends um, a year working there. And while he's working at the tenement house department, he tries out a couple of law schools, night law schools for size. Um, first, he tries um, New York Law School, and then he tries um, New York University Law School, which he called um, in his memoir, Bad Law Schools. Uh, my, my, my apology, uh, D Dean McKenzie, for, for that <laughs> totally um, okay. judgment. Uh, and forgive me. Um, and then he was um, all set to pay his deposit at Columbia Law School and quit the Tenement House Department altogether um, when he ran into a friend of his and his friend said, um, come with me to Coney Island today. And so Frankfurter took his tuition and he blew it at Coney Island, just, you know, spent all of his money at Coney Island that day with his friend and he didn't have the tuition anymore or the deposit anymore to spend at Columbia Law School. And he didn't really know what to do. And a, a friend of his at the Tenement House Department said, you know, my brother goes to Harvard Law School and you, you could go there too. So he applies to Harvard Law School um, after his colleague's brother tells him to go. Um, he ends up rooming with his colleague's brother, a, a lawyer by the name of um, Sam Rosenson. And um, he, he, Harvard in those days was pretty easy to get into, and it was really hard to stay um, because a third of the first year class um, flunked out. And, and um, so um, Frankfurter didn't flunk out. He finished first in his class after his first year, first in his class after his second year, and first in his class at the end of his third year. But at the end of his third year, um, when he went looking for a law firm job at a law Wall Street law firm, he couldn't get one. Um, he couldn't get one because um, Wall Street firms in those days really didn't hire Jews. Finally, after some um, some sealed references from the dean of Harvard Law School, James Barr Ames, did Frankfurter land a job at one of these um, Wall Street law firms, and he lasted three months. Um, after three months, um, he got a call um, from the U.S. attorney from the Southern District of New York, um, Henry Stimson. Stimson asked Frankfurter to come work for him, and Frankfurter accepted. And that changed Frankfurter's life, because Frankfurter, Frankfurter learned from Henry Stimson the joys of public service. Um, he worked with all of these young um, former Law Review editors at Columbia, at Yale, at Harvard. Stimson didn't really have a big budget under St Theodore Roosevelt, um, but he had some evidence that, that massive sugar fraud was being committed by the sugar trust in the way they were importing that sugar, in the way they were weighing the sugar, um, in the way they were getting rebates um, from the railroad companies. So Frankfurter and Stimson and others, um, they prosecuted the sugar fraud. Um, the sugar trust made national headlines. And then Frankfurter followed Stimson. Stimson then ran for governor of New York onto the campaign trail where lo and behold, um, he's on the campaign trail um, with former President Theodore Roosevelt. And it's at this, this point, while campaigning for Stimson unsuccessfully um, as the Democratic nominee for governor, um, that he and Roosevelt strike up what is a lifelong friendship. And they are on a first name basis um, for the rest of their lives. Frankfurter follows Stimson into the Taft administration. Um, Taft makes Stimson Secretary of War and Frankfurter becomes his legal counsel. And it's there in Washington in 1911 where Frankfurter moves into a house in DuPont Circle and on, on you know, just on the north side of DuPont Circle, for those of you familiar with DC or right near Kramer Books um, in Washington, um, into a little house that they turn into a progressive political salon.
And that salon, they invite a who's who of people in Washington. They invite over Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Um, they invite then lawyer Louis Brandeis. And they, uh, what unites the people in that salon is they think Taft's a really bad president. And they think that the way to save organized labor is to reinstall Theodore Roosevelt um, as president, uh, you know, and, and to um, defeat Taft um, in 1912. And they name their house. Um, they name their house after their philosophical disputes with Oliver Wendell Holmes. They call it the House of Truth. And it's there that Frankfurter becomes very close to Holmes, very close to Brandeis. And, um, you know, he's sort of he's on his way. He's also, through Henry Stimson, caught this gospel of public service. 1914, Harvard Law School calls him back there from Washington, where he becomes the first Jewish professor at Harvard Law School. Um, he serves on the Harvard Law faculty from 1914 to 1939. Um, during World War I in 1917, he's called back to Washington, where he goes back into the War Department. I should say it's here in the New York bar where he meets someone that, that he sees again in World War I, this sort of indifferent New York lawyer he meets at lunch at the New York City bar. His name's Franklin Roosevelt. Well, um, when he comes back to the War Department in 1917, um, Roosevelt's, of course, in, in the Navy Department and and. Frankfurter's the head of the War Labor Policies Board um, that's trying to set labor policy. Um, Roosevelt is a member of that board and they um, become friends. Roosevelt invites Frankfurter over to lunch um, one day and Eleanor's um, reaction is sort of priceless. Um, she writes her mother-in-law of Frankfurter, an interesting little man, but very Jew. Um, that's her reaction <laughs> uh, to him. But, but he really takes off um, in, in World War I um, and, and really, I think, starts to defend civil liberties when um, things go awry um, in the Wilson administration. So um, when he's back at Harvard and even beforehand, um, he becomes an opponent of the Palmer raids. Um, he calls out A. Mitchell Palmer um, for um, the way he conducted the Palmer raids as violating the Constitution. He and Zachariah Chafee defended um, some Boston immigrants who are rounded up and scheduled for deportation um, during the Palmer raids. He becomes a founding member um, of the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, he becomes a huge critic of what he views as an anti-labor Supreme Court. Um, in 1927, he's one of the most prominent defenders of um, Sacco and Vanzetti, um, two Italian anarchists um, who are um, convicted of robbery and murder and scheduled for execution. Um, he joins the National Legal, Legal Committee um, of the NAACP. And then in 1929, lo and behold, he becomes um, an outside advisor to then governor. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, and then presidential candidate um, Franklin Roosevelt. And it's Roosevelt who, in 1939, uh, nominates Frankfurter to the Supreme Court um, of the United States. Let me talk to you a little bit about Frankfurter's judicial philosophy and what I think are one of the messages um, of my book. Um, I think a lot of people saw Frankfurter as this liberal lawyer who was challenging the Palmer raids um, and founding the ACLU and standing up for Sacco and Vanzetti and, and joining the NAACP's legal committee, this liberal lawyer turned conservative justice. And I think I argue through in the book that he's the same guy uh, the whole time. And, and, and Frankfurter's philosophy was sort of baked in during his second year of law school, in which a case gets decided called Lochner versus New York. And for those of non-lawyers in the audience, um, that's a case where the Supreme Court of the United States struck down a maximum hour law for bakers. Before the Supreme Court of the United States struck it down, um, the New York Court of Appeals um, invalidated the law. And in fact, um, there was a huge amount of criticism at, directed at the New York Attorney General, Julius Mayer, for how he defended um, that New York law. But to me, Lochner was this moment where Frankfurter saw this anti-labor, anti-worker Supreme Court of the United States. And he, in law school, became very attracted to a theory associated um, with a former Harvard law professor, James Bradley Thayer. 
And Thayer's philosophy, in short, was that the Supreme Court should not strike down a federal law unless it was unconstitutional beyond a reasonable doubt. And so for the rest of his life, um, Frankfurter um, was a Thayerian, um, starting with Lochner, but also um, after Brandeis joined the court in 1916, Frankfurter took over some of his Supreme Court litigation and defended Oregon minimum wage um, and maximum hour laws before the Supreme Court of the United States quite successfully um, and, and, and persuaded the court to keep his hand its hands off of these pro-labor state laws. Um, he was less successful in 1923 um, in a case called Atkins versus Children's Hospital. Frankfurter and his colleagues thought they had buried Lochner or in lawyers' language that they had overruled Lochner kind of sub silentio through some of these minimum wage and, and maximum hour cases. And the Supreme Court um, in Atkins revives Lochner and says liberty of contract is the rule and, um, rather than the exception, right? And so um, calls into question all this pro-labor legislation. After he loses the Atkins case, Frankfurter tells Brandeis and his friend Learned Hand, who he often lunch with um, at the New York City Bar, that he thought the due process clause of the Constitution should be written out of the Constitution because it gives lawyers too much power. And, and he felt that way um, for the rest of his life, even in civil liberties episodes um, like Sacco and Vanzetti, Frankfurter was not urging the Supreme Court of the United States, was not urging Holmes and Brandeis and Harlan Fistone, um, who were all um, approached to grant stays of execution to Sacco and Vanzetti. Frankfurter wrote this book in 1927 um, about the Sacco and Vanzetti case in March of 27, and he wrote it to try to persuade the Su Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts to overturn um, Sacco and Vanzetti's convictions and to persuade the governor of Massachusetts um, to either grant Sacco and Vanzetti um, either a pardon or clemency. So he never thought that the federal courts and particularly the Supreme Court of the United States should, should play this outsized role. Um, this is the same when he was on the Supreme Court of the United States um, in another case um, that Solicitor General Underwood's going to discuss about Willie Francis in 1946. Um, he um, was convicted of murder in Louisiana and sentenced to death. Um, his executioners were, were drunk when they set up the electric chair and they didn't set the electric chair up properly. So the first time they tried to execute him, they did not kill him. So um, Willie Francis's lawyer, um, a, a guy named Jay Skelly Wright, who becomes a famous federal judge, um, he takes um, Willie Francis's case um, all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States and says, hey, this violates cruel and unusual punishment to try to um, execute Willie Francis again. It violates due process to try to um, execute um, Willie Francis again. And Frankfurter, um, although he thought the court should take Willie Francis' case and grant certiorari, um, he wrote this concurrence saying, you know, I'm opposed to cash, capital punishment, but there's nothing I can do here because I don't believe the due process clause um, should be used in this way. Um, Frankfurter believed in what he called um, our federalism. He believed um, that we had um, federal courts and state courts for a reason. Um, he thought um, state and local officials should do their jobs. In fact, um, after um, the, the Supreme Court ruled against um, Willie Francis Frankfurter, asked one of his um, law school classmates, Mar Monty Lemon, to use his contacts in the state of Louisiana um, to try to get um, Willie Francis um, clemency or a pardon. Um, Frankfurter really shared, I think, Jefferson's democratic faith. Um, in fact, I've written about a famous speech um, Frankfurter gave at the Library of Congress. Um, it was a lecture on April 13th, 1943, on the bicentennial of Jefferson's birth. And um, when the opening of the, Je around the time of the opening of the Jefferson Memorial, um, and, and he praised Jefferson. He said, um, Jefferson had faith, um, but it was, and he means faith in democracy, but it was not founded on naivete. naivete. He thought democracy, um, he Frankfurter, was an unremitting endeavor. It means that democracy had to be something that people worked at. Um, they couldn't outsource the democratic political process um, to the Supreme Court um, of the United States. And he saw um, state Supreme Courts as playing a role.
um, in that democratic process. Um, so my book makes kind of two points. I'm going to end up here and and, and open this up to our um, group of panelists. Um, my, my first argument in my book is that um, Frankfurter saw judicial restraint as a liberal constitutional theory, and that he really adapted judicial restraint from the judicial restraint of Holmes and Brandeis. Holmes and Brandeis were really bad on race. Um, they had a lot of cases, um, such as Gonglum versus Rice, where they're unanimous, um, uh, you know, uh, in favor of separate but equal. Um, but Frankfurter um, really had an exception to judicial restraint. And that exception was to use the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause um, to prevent discrimination against African Americans. Um, he does that in 1944 um, in outlawing the all white primary in Smith versus All Right. He does that in the graduate school segregation cases um, in 1948 to 1950, um, with the help of his law clerk, um, the first African-American law clerk at the Supreme Court, William T. Coleman, um, wrote him an incredible memo that I think really helped sh shape Frankfurter's um, thinking on that case. And even in 1954, um, in, with Brown versus Board of Education in those companion cases, um, the idea that Earl Warren single-handedly um, achieved unanimity of nine votes um, is laughable. Warren doesn't join the court as a confirmed member until March 1954. And one of the things my book shows is that it's Frankfurter and Hugo Black both during the 1952 term when Browns argued the first time and in the 1953 term, which, but for much of which Warren isn't even a confirmed member of the court. It's those two who are really helping Warren make sure that the courts vote um, in, in Brown v. Board and, and those companion cases are unanimous. And then um, even in cases of voting discrimination, in 1960 in Gamillion versus Lightfoot, um, Frankfurter writes um, the majority opinion um, outlawing this 28-sided um, sea dragon in which um, the city officials of Tuskegee, Alabama, try to disenfranchise all but three or four black members um, of, of the city of Tuskegee. Um, so, you know, I don't think that, that he was judicial restraint all the way down. I think when it came to issues of race, um, he modified um, judicial restraint. Um, and now, most famously in Baker versus Carr, um, and that's the case where the state of Tennessee um, failed to reapportion um, its state legislative districts for um, 60 years. Frankfurter was in dissent. He's in dissent from an opinion um, that says um, this violates equal protection, um, equal protection jurisprudence, which is well developed and familiar without telling anyone what those standards are. Um, that court also said in Justice Brennan's words um, that the Supreme Court was the quote unquote ultimate constitutional interpreter. Um, he was not going to sign on um, to, to give the Supreme Court that kind of power, um, even in a case where Tennessee fails to reapportion um, for 60 years. Um, Frankfurter's second contribution, besides adapting judicial restraint to protect the rights of African Americans, um, was encouraging generations of Harvard Law students and law clerks to enter public service. The things that Henry Stimson taught him, the things that C.C. Burlingham taught him, and that his friend Learned Hand taught him, the things that the New York City Bar taught him, um, was that, um, that his law students and his law clerks shouldn't go to New York, Chicago, or D.C. law firms. They should go into the federal government because that's the highest possible calling. And, and so generations of Harvard Law students went into public service because of, of Felix Frankfurter. And they weren't just um, the you know privileged white Anglo-Saxon Protestants like Dean Acheson. They were um, the famous black lawyer, Charles Hamilton Houston. Um, they were um, Houston's cousin and another, the second black member of the Harvard Law Review, William Hasty, James Landis, Tom Corcoran, Alger Hiss, William T. Coleman, Elliot Richardson, um, Richard Goodwin, I could go on and on, but needless to say, there is a former Frankfurter student or law clerk in every presidential administration from Woodrow Wilson to Jimmy Carter. That's an enormous legacy. So I'm going to leave it right there and, and, and open this up to our esteemed panel. Thank you for listening to me um, about Felix Frankfurter. As you can tell already, it's quite a wonderful book. Continuing our business, um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce
the three panelists who now join the conversation. Um, on my far right is Dean Troy McKenzie of NYU Law School. Um, in the middle is Chief Judge Jonathan Lipman of the New York Court of Appeals and the New York Court System, and now of Latham and Watkins. And on my immediate right is Barbara Underwood, former Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, Acting Solicitor General of the United States, Attorney General of the State of New York, and today Solicitor General of the State of New York. Um, each of them is a superstar and a historical expert and a legal expert, and from a different direction gets to take a cut at Felix Frankfurter. Um, so I'll begin with the chief. Um, chief Judge Lipman, from a jurist's perspective, uh, how do you assess Felix Frankfurter? What does he mean to you? Well, there's so much to admire uh, Frankfurter as a person. You know, uh, um, two decades on the Supreme Court, his immigrant uh, story, the House of Truth, um, all his relationships, his enormous influence on the government of the United States. Um, he is an intellect beyond compare and certainly uh, deserved all the accolades over the years. As a judge, and I think that um, Brad's book really points this out, the defining uh, um, uh, piece of Frankfurter's legacy is about this idea of judicial self-restraint. Um, he believed that, in essence, that you didn't do judicial review other than in the most extreme circumstances. You deferred to the Congress and to the executive. And um, he believed that the courts shouldn't be doing what he regarded as anti-democratic policymaking. Uh, his views were informed to a great degree by his um, service in the War Department. Uh, look at the Japanese internment case, where he agreed that um, you know the the, uh, the that wartime step was something that uh, made sense. Against again, there was lots of criticism of it. Um, also, his fealty to FDR and to the economic and social reforms of the New Deal also informed this judicial self-restraint. I mean, he was an insider on the New Deal even after he was a Supreme Court justice, which today might uh, not you know, happen exactly in that regard, or people would take pictures of him coming into the, uh, out of the White House. Um, but this, this um, uh, judicial self-restraint self had nothing to do with a lot of the terms we hear today, this, this neutral interpretive methodology, whether it be textualism or originalism or literalism, um, this, this was not, you know, what, what he was about. And um, in fact, those terms today, you know, are used in one degree or another uh, by the different political factions to, uh, uh, to sometimes support a form of judicial activism rather than uh, judicial restraint. So um, by the same token, I think when you look at uh, um, Frankfurter, and I think Brad sort of uh, hinted at that, certainly in the book there's one hint at it, he certainly wasn't the person who believed in a dead constitution. This is not what, what he was all about. Um, he really, you know, talked about um, judges making informed decisions, wise decisions in an evolving democratic progressive society. So he wasn't saying that that the Constitution was was in any way not malleable. Um, and I think what he didn't foresee in terms of today's world and how it impacts on the courts. And as a judge, he certainly didn't, um, I don't think he could have anticipated, even though there was some of that in those days, the extreme polarization today of our political life that um, I, I don't think he could have seen that as the great challenge to the liberal tradition, which it's, uh, which it's become. Um, 
you know, the Supreme Court of the United States doesn't defer to Congress or the president today. You know, while, while uh, Frankfurter looked towards a robust uh, a federal government, I don't think he quite would have gotten the robust judiciary that we have today that's caused by this kind of uh, uh, polarization that I was talking about. Um, and as for, uh, and Brad talked a little bit about this, as for a defendant, of, a defender of rights and where uh, uh, that all fits in in Frankfurter's philosophy, even with this uh, um, judicial safe, self-restraint philosophy, he talked a lot about due process and social justice and a liberal society and federalism and different regards. And we can talk about some of it later where he's on uh, different sides of that issue sometimes. Um, but overall, you know, I used to say when they asked me about, you know, my own judicial philosophy, are you an active, an activist judge? And I always say, no, I don't consider myself an activist judge, but I do consider myself proactive in the pursuit of justice. I don't think Frankfurter was an activist judge by any means given this overriding philosophy that he had. And I don't think he was quite, although in certain regards, particularly with racial justice, as Brad indicated, I wouldn't totally look at him as proactive in the pursuit of justice uh, either. And I think what's interesting when you try and set, assess him as a jurist, he doesn't necessarily have the kinds of decisions, noteworthy decisions, that we look at today and we say, you know, a great Supreme Court justice. In fact, many of his decisions, certainly in the later years, would the sense sometimes bitterly so, but you don't have that kind of profile of judicial decision making that maybe we would look to today as the signature of a great Supreme Court justice. He certainly at the time and over the years, I'd say until Brad's book, was viewed as a great disappointment to progressives. You know, that, that doctrine of judicial self-restraint uh, was really not exactly what the progressives had in mind given uh, uh, Frankfurter's liberal philosophy, you know, of the support of unions and, and you know, in all the ways that he used judicial self-restraint to say leave into effect, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the gains in terms of workers' rights and all of that and his support of the New Deal, you know, and even um, if you look at his uh, uh, behind the scenes support of Roosevelt's court packing, you know, which didn't go anywhere. After that, you know, a lot of the reforms of the New Deal came into fruition because of sort of the, the um, uh, um, ambiance that had been created by Roosevelt uh, seeking to pack the court. So I, I think that um, judicial self-restraint does define uh, um, Frankfurter, but I think he's much more complicated than that. I think Brad alluded uh, uh, in some of the ways that that's the case, and we could talk a little bit of, uh, more about it, and there's different... Um, some of his decisions are very interesting and how you would look at it in terms of today and then. So um, uh, I think there's a reassessment going on in terms of Frankfurter. And thank you, Brad, for creating that. Uh, I think which clearly is the case today. We're starting to look at Frankfurter and say, wait a second, with all the progressives throwing things at him all these years and saying, oh, look at the, the liberal Frankfurter who wound up being you know, such an opponent of uh, of of a strong uh, uh, judiciary, and again, it was it was uh, um, uh, based in this belief in democracy. You know that that uh, that that the elected representatives of the people, you know, they made policy, not judges who were not particularly. He didn't believe that they're particularly skilled 
at the policy side and that it's the elected representatives of the people who are. So that's kind of a little bit of an assessment of him from a judicial point of view. Thank you, Chief. Um, Solicitor General Underwood, let me turn to you. Um, I forgot to biographically identify you as a uh, recovered law professor, but once upon a time, she was a Yale law professor. Um, but perhaps most specifically as a top government lawyer who's argued many cases to the U.S. Supreme Court, who handles the state's litigation in the state courts, um, and from all of your perspectives, uh, how do you assess Felix Frankfurter? Well, I, I'm not going to disagree very much with anything that Jonathan just said, but I think I have a little bit of a different gloss on it. I, I think, of course, that Frankfurter made an important and admirable effort to develop principles of judicial restraint to guide judicial decision making. Principles that we may very much want to call on today. Um, and part of it was to earn respect for the, oh, I don't know what about its purpose, but at least part of its effect and likely its purpose was to earn respect for the Supreme Court as a non-political arbiter of disputes as different from the other branches of government um, because that kind of respect would induce compliance with its rulings, which it otherwise, it doesn't have, you know, it's famously doesn't have an army or any other way to compel compliance. But of course, like all judges, he had to deal with the conflict between his principles of judicial restraint and the demands of justice in particular cases. And uh, even though I place a very high value on principled decision-making, I found the way that he prioritized doctrine over justice sometimes profoundly disappointing. And I think a great example of that was the case of Louisiana X. Rel. Francis versus Reese Weber, decided in 1947 that Brad mentioned earlier. And I'll just do a quick reprise of the facts. The defendant was convicted of murder in Louisiana. I think it matters that we're talking about Louisiana. This is a black man who was convicted of murdering a white victim um, and sentenced to death. And he was placed in the electric chair, which did not kill him. There's apparently a factual dispute between the parties about whether current passed through him or not. He alleges that it did. The state says that it didn't. And it's unclear from the it doesn't appear that evidence was taken or that that question was actually resolved. He asked the state and federal courts in many petitions to bar a second effort to electrocute him, invoking principles of double jeopardy and cruel and unusual punishment and due process. And the Supreme Court was sharply divided. Four justices voted to prohibit a second try at least if the allegations of current going through him were true, and they, they would have remanded for a factual determination on that point. Um, and they, they basically said this would be tantamount to torture, that repeated efforts to electrocute some, somebody were qualitatively different from a one-shot electrocution and would be they, they talked about principles of cruel and unusual punishment and due process. Four justices voted to deny relief because there was no evil intent on the part of the government. It was just an accident. That's not so bad. It's not like they intended to torture him. They just accidentally tortured him. That's not what they said. They didn't torture him. They There was just a malfunction. Um, and Frankfurter, who had... Now, the deciding vote here, who had voted to grant cert in the case, so presumably had thought there was something to this petition. Uh, he had voted to grant cert along with the justice, justices who wanted to grant relief on the merits. He voted to deny relief on principles of judicial restraint, saying that, A, 
double jeopardy and cruel and unusual punishment were irrelevant because he disagreed with the then emerging doctrine that the um, the Bill of Various Provisions, criminal procedure provisions in the Bill of Rights are incorporated into the 14th Amendment. This was a very live controversy at that time, and he did not want to lend any support to that, to the argument that they are incorporated. And B, that the court could interfere with the state's criminal justice system only for conduct that offends fundamental standards of decency that are more or less universally accepted. And this wasn't that bad. Um, and partly that was because C or three, I forget which way I was counting here, um, leaving the matter to executive clemency rather than to the courts doesn't offend fundamental principles of justice. Now that's kind of an interesting twist in the rhetoric here. He doesn't say a second try at execution comports with fundamental principles of justice. Perhaps he couldn't bring himself to say that. He says, leaving the matter to clemency doesn't offend fundamental principles of justice. Now to me, that seems like trying to have it both ways to say, this is truly terrible, but it should be handled by someone else. And the someone else who should handle it was somebody who I don't believe he could have thought would actually grant relief. He did make some efforts to, to get through other people to try to get clemency for, um, for this defendant. But I can't believe that at that time in Louisiana, he thought that this defendant was going to get relief through clemency. So that's Felix Frankfurter and judicial restraint. And I, I think that judicial restraint is important, but I think applying it and those principles rigidly, I mean, nobody thinks it can be absolutely rigidly applied. He made an exception for race. And I guess what I'm really taking issue with is the idea that there didn't seem to be much else that warranted an exception. I wouldn't go all the way to the other extreme and say, we don't have these principles. We don't have to wrestle with these principles. We should just do what we think is just in every case. I, I don't think that's the right way to proceed either. I think a judge, particularly on the Supreme Court, needs to, needs to um, struggle with pr appropriate principles of restraint and other principles so that the decision making doesn't seem just completely um, one off decision making by an individual about what he thinks justice is. But I think he also needs to um, attend to the consequences of his decision and sometimes find that these rigid principles of restraint might need to be relaxed. So, and I'm going to talk later about this, but I think uh, uh, Judith Kay in the New York Court of Appeals gave us a very good example of um, regarding principles as important, but also recognizing that there's a time, there are times to um, relax those principles in the service of justice. Great. Thank you. Um, Dean Troy McKenzie, you uh, are a procedure professor, as Frankfurter was. Uh, you clerked at the Supreme Court for Justice John Paul Stevens. You've served in a high Department of Justice office, uh, and you are a man of a law school, uh, now a great one, wherever it was back <laughs> in the day. Um, what's your take from all of those perspectives on Felix Frankfurter? So, you know, the, the, the paradox of Frankfurter from an academic perspective is that he was in many ways the most law professory of Supreme Court justices. Indeed, his colleagues would complain about being lectured to by Professor Frankfurter. He went directly from his uh, professorship at Harvard Law School to the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, one could say he never really left that academic um, uh, way of seeing the world. So you would think that in the academy, Frankfurter is lionized as someone who was not just a great mind, but an extraordinary justice. 
And that's not been the case. The reputation that Frankfurter has carried with him is as someone who was extraordinarily influential as a professor because of his his roles, so many different roles, his active, energetic, thoughtful approach to so many problems, his mentorship of uh, a generation of Harvard Law students, and then when he was on the bench, a generation of law clerks. But the general sense is that he was a failure as a judge. And the the sort of short take on that is he brought this view of how the world operated circa mid-1930s with him to the Supreme Court. And then the world changed, but he didn't. So he was beating on about judicial restraint well after the court of the Lochner era had collapsed and the problems of the world before the court were very different. So there he is dissenting in Barnett. How could you dissent in Barnett wanting to um, uphold a flag salute requirement, right? I mean, how could you take your judicial restraint to such an extent that you wouldn't see the, the simple justice in ruling in favor of um, the Jehovah's Witnesses' children. So that's the general view of Frankfurter as a, from an academic perspective, or at least the that's kind of the standard version of Frankfurter. Incredibly influential as a professor, but too much of the professor who tried to be consistent well into his time on the bench. So two comments on that. One is uh, on the first piece, his influence as a professor, it really is extraordinary. He is, in effect, the creator of the field of federal courts as a topic of study. Ironically, studying the federal courts from a, frankly, hostile perspective. Um, there was a great article, and I'm blanking on the name of the, of the uh, professor who wrote the article about 10 years ago, that is an article about a case book. It's not something one normally would do but it is a, an article about the very first casebook on the subject of the study of the federal courts. And it was Frankfurter's casebook. I guess it was Frankfurter and Landis, their, their casebook. And the article runs through the topics that Frankfurter decides should be included in a federal courts casebook. Many of those topics have carried through to a modern federal courts curriculum. And they're all topics that are what a progressive circa 1925 is angry at the Supreme Court about. <laughs> um, you know, the labor injunction, on and on and on, all of the things that the federal courts are doing that from a progressive standpoint, uh, the court shouldn't be doing. And instead, the courts should be stepping back and allowing um, uh, elected officials, particularly in the states and state courts to step forward on. So there is this sense that he is this extraordinary figure as an academic. Then he gets to the Supreme Court and um, and kind of doesn't realize that he needed to turn a page and, and find a new tune. Let me just close with this, however. Today, if you take a snapshot of Frankfurter and the Legal Academy, there is a new generation of uh, judicial restraint, Thayerian, um, approaches to the question of judicial review. So partly, I think, to be candid, a response to the current makeup of the Supreme Court, partly to a sense from a number of academics over a much longer period of time that running to the federal courts in order to get relief is counterproductive that organizing democratically is better for longer term change and um, and uh, and reform, or that leaving space to the state courts, which have often been able to rely on their own constitutions with positive rights and more flexible approaches to important questions of rights than the federal courts. So this moment, and, and I, again, I wanna hold this up for everyone, buy this book. It's an excellent book. But this really is a Frankfurterian moment because within the academy, the reassessment of Frankfurter 
is ongoing and uh, and the the standard story of frankfurter as as failure out of step someone who brought a narrow academic view to a much more complicated canvas that story has started to shift and shift in ways that have made frankfurter uh, more intriguing and more attractive uh, to a new generation of academics thank you very much um as we go forward, I hope there will be a lot of byplay among the panelists. So for starters, uh, Professor Snyder, we've all been working hard to sell your book. Um, what comments or replies to these three? Well, I, I want to put my historian hat on for a little bit and just if we could go into a time machine back to 1944. And, and, and I think we would see that some of the cases involving racial justice were not a small lift, right? When when um, Smith versus Allwright overrules Grovey versus Townsend in the all white primary case, um, that was um, front page news. Um, the graduate school um, segregation cases um, leading up to uh, were, were huge, right? And, and even Brown itself, right, was an enormous accomplishment and arriving at reasoning for justices who believed in judicial restraint, um, like Justice Frankfurter did and like Justice Jackson did, um, was a hard case, right? It's why Frankfurter had his then law clerk, Alexander Bickel, spend the entire 1952 term um, immersed in the Congressional Globes, trying to figure out what the history of the 14th Amendment was and which way the history of the 14th Amendment cut in that case. And then the enormous amount of backlash that the court received as a result of Brown versus Board of Education and its companion case, Bowling versus Sharp. In 1956, um, you get the Southern Manifesto um, by members of Congress. Um, then you get the Jenner Butler Bill, um, where members of Congress um, are trying to um, strip the court of jurisdiction in certain categories of cases. You're having the John Birch Society um, with the impeach Earl Warren movement, um, which was all in reaction um, to Brown versus Board of Education. This was a the project of standing up for disenfranchised African Americans throughout the American South was an enormous accomplishment and adapting judicial restraint and not saying judicial restraint all the way down um, is an enormous accomplishment. And I know that's hard to see um, in 2023, but I think if you go back to 1944, you'd see that that 10 to 14 year period was was a huge lift for the court. And I think where Frankfurter got off the train of the Warren court um, was not in 1954, but really in 19. 58 with a case called Cooper versus Aaron, um, which was in response um, to Orville Faubus um, disobeying federal court orders with the um, in the desegregation of Little Rock's public schools after the desegregation uh, of Central High School, where Justice Brennan says, we have the last word on the Constitution, see Marbury versus Madison. That's the same line he repeats four years later in Baker versus Carr, where he says, we're the ultimate constitutional interpreter. And that's where I think for Frankfurter, the stop sign goes up. Like, wait a minute. Like, we can't, uh, the judicial power and the power of the Supreme Court of the United States is starting to look like a one-way ratchet to him, to borrow a phrase um, of Justice Frankfurter's. And he sees um, the dangers to that. I don't think... Um, as Solicitor General Babcock said, um, I don't think he was worried about the institution of the Supreme Court as much as he was about the damage it would do to our democracy, that we would just outsource all of our thorny, politicized problems to the Supreme Court of the United States. And in that respect, I think he's really prescient, because I think that's what what's happening today, is that we're really politicized, and rather than have um, our elected members of Congress or our elected members of state governments um, resolve some of these problems. The Supreme Court of the United States um, is the one that has to put its thumb on the scale on all these problems. And that's Frankfurter's nightmare. And, and I would just say in response to Dean McKenzie, um, I, I've been equally sort of, I found it remarkable, this rise of Thayerians among this young generations of scholars, and I admire them very much. I want to name a few, Nico Bowie, Ryan Dorfler, Daphna Rainin at Harvard Law School, Sam Moyne at Yale Law School. I've been amazed by that, but I, I saw it coming a little bit earlier. And let me 
tell you where I, I saw it coming. Um, two cases really. Um, one is a um 1996 case i think um city of bernie versus flores um was not only does the supreme court strike down um the religious freedom um, restoration act or at least part of it but the supreme court eviscerates congress's power to enforce um the 14th amendment i think um at that point people like larry kramer start to say wait a minute here the supreme court doesn't have the last word on the constitution the the people do and then if it's not crystal clear, then the, the, the Supreme Court in 2000 in Bush versus Gore, when it um, you know overrides the Florida Supreme Court's decision in, in how the state of Florida is going to recount its votes um, during the 2000 presidential election, for those of you who weren't alive at the mm -hmm. time, as many of my law uh, students um, uh, were not, uh, um, you know, uh, when the court does that and says, there's no we don't, we're not worried about the political question doctrine and and there i can sort of see frankfurt saying see i told you so right if you ignore the political question doctrine you get an all-powerful supreme court that decides cases based on equal protection standards that are good for one train only right which is essentially what the court did um in bush versus gore so i, I saw bernie and bush v gore as the beginning where scholars like mark tushnet start to reassess. You know, Touchdown was a huge Frankfurter foe. And, and after Bernie and Bush v. Gore, he starts to say, hey, maybe Frankfurter was right in Baker versus Carr. Maybe we are, um, the Supreme Court does have too much power um, in our democracy. So, uh, you know, that's just my sort of preliminary response. I can't um, respond to everything because there were so many great mm -hmm. points um, made by all of you, but, but that's just my kind of first cut response to that. Could I just make one Please. point of privilege here? Um, uh, there are, my name is not Babcock. Oh, I'm sorry, Barbara Underwood. I, I apologize. Barbara Babcock um, was a professor at Stanford. I apologize. No, all, all uh, Solicitor General Underwood. No, no, no. Bar the barber threw me. Um, comments from either of you, Troy? So, um, just, just very briefly, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the question that should be hanging all, over all of this is, do we become Frankfurterians when you know we don't like what the Supreme Court's doing today, and suddenly we find a new religion of judicial restraint? But as soon as we get the Supreme Court we like, then we turn around and we say, you know, let's put Frankfurter back in the attic where he belongs because he's so annoying. Um, and that's a question I ask myself. Now, I'm... Um, I, I, I'm saying to to Brad earlier, um, I went to law school at a time when I had to read Democracy and Distrust by John Hart Ely, which is an attempt to square the circle of the Warren Court's um, activist approach to a number of important questions uh, using judicial review and a little bit of, of uh, Frankfurterian judicial restraint. And Ely's view is to the extent that the court's intervention is is um, democracy enhancing, then it's okay. So that explains Brown, that explains other areas. It's a sort of a footnote four of Caroline Product's approach to judicial review. Um, and that that's an approach that seemed really sensible to me, but that itself has fallen out of favor in the academy. Um, I was surprised at the it's kind of not not every con law professor still teaches democracy and distrust. It's sort of it's it's considered yesterday's yesterday's item. And I, I, I just have to say, I wonder, though, whether our attraction or repulsion with respect to Frankfurter is sort of stick a finger in the wind and whether you like today's Supreme Court or don't like today's Supreme Court. And if it is, then, um, you know, maybe Frankfurter isn't a hero and we're the problem. Let me follow right on that, which is a nice segue uh, by turning to our federalism, which is another force, uh, perhaps, to react to our Supreme Court and a realm of actors who have tools in the state court system to uh, do better or do differently and to do more protectively for the individual than the federal courts led by the Supreme Court may at a point in time. Um, as you've heard, Frankfurter was a litigator in the Massachusetts SJC. Um, he was never a state court judge, uh, but 
uh, we have a former chief of New York and we have a leading state court litigator and a close student of state court. So I want to pivot into federalism by asking Chief Judge Lipman if Frankfurter's theory of judicial restraint applies to state court judging in general, and especially to the piece of that that is interpreting a state court, interpreting a state's constitution. Well, you know, uh, no, I don't think particularly applies to state court judging. I think we're acutely aware, um, you know, apropos of what Troy was saying, acutely aware of the direction that the present Supreme Court is going. Um, you know, and in the state courts, we very much are aware of the development of the common law and the idea the independent analysis of state constitutions, irrespective of where the federal courts or the Supreme Court is going, particularly state constitutions as a source of individual liberties. And if you look at uh, um, Justice Brennan's uh, uh, whole idea that, gee, with the retrenchment after the Warren Court, now is the time that you and the state courts have to step up to the plate. And Judith Kay, my predecessor, burst onto the scene, picking up on Brennan's, you know, thought process, and the two of them advocating in such a strong way for state uh, protections that are greater than the liberties maybe that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, uh, might recognize. And, um, you know, Frank Fido, where does he fit to all of that? Well, certainly his uh, associate crime of Brandeis, you know, looked at the courts as a, uh, the laboratories, right? That state courts are the laboratories. And um, I, I'm not sure that uh, the Frank Fido would disagree with that. I mean, look at some of his cases. We talked a little bit before about the flag cases where he was in the majority first and then in the West Virginia case in the dissent, you know, it's sort of a federalism kind of issue. Brown one and two, you know, and then Cooper and where does he go on all of that? Um, in the, the stomach pumping case in California, where he talks a lot about due process and courts making, again, wise judgments in a progressive society as it evolves. Um, you know, courts making the right judgments, and a lot of times, I think that does relate to the state courts, and that's what we're trying to do in this idea of, of um, independently uh, analyzing the state constitutional protections, even when the language, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, even when the language is very similar, if not the same, to the federal constitution. So um, for the New York Court of Appeals, no, I don't, I don't think judicial restraint is a, is, it plays exactly into the modern uh, court as we know it today. Um, and there were courts that go much further than the New York Court of Appeals. Look at Oregon. You don't have to raise state constitution or state constitutionalism. They'll just recognize it without you even raising it. Um, you know, the feds have different considerations. They have to consider, consider the sovereignty of all the states. Well, New York doesn't have to consider that. We have to consider the sovereignty here in New York. That's what we have to look at. And even the Supreme Court has recognized quite clearly that when it comes to fundamental rights, the state courts are free to decide those fundamental issues to protect the rights of its citizens. So I don't think it's a perfect fit, although again, Frankfurter is such an interesting character and, and so many of the different things that he's talked about or written about, either when he wasn't on the bench and when he uh, was on the bench, uh, don't make it, you know, a, a perfect fit. And certainly, I think that um, in New York, we have a particular history of that. And again, uh, 
Brennan sort of raised this issue and then Judith Kay pounced on it. And that, uh, um, uh, that whole idea of state constitution is very much alive uh, in New York uh, today and um, as it should be in my mind. Okay, um, Barbara, can I ask you the same question? Is, is Frankfurter's restraint irrelevant as we think of state courts? Um, irrelevant seems to me a strong word. I do think that the reasons that seem to motivate Frankfurter's judicial restraint are not applicable for the most part at the state level because his view of judicial restraint for federal courts seems to be based very heavily on um, enforcing, uh, uh, on the separation of powers within the branches of the federal government and on federalism, that is respect for the state courts. And neither of those is applicable in quite the same way. There's of course no federalism issue when a state court is imposing a state constitutional rule on state actors. There could be a separation of powers question, but the separation of powers in the states isn't necessarily the same as it is in the federal government. It may not exist at all, or it, there's no particular reason to think it's the same. So um, some of the reasons to be concerned about overreach or lack of restraint in the courts could be applicable at the state level, but I don't think anything about Frankfurter's kind of doctrinal framework really transplants wholesale into the state context. But but I do think it is potentially suggestive, just like the law of another state could be suggestive, though it's in no way controlling on this state. That um and that that I think is what gave rise, well, is part of what gave rise to a to a series of opinions, and it's not just PJ video. There were there were many, many opinions for the state court of appeals by different judges, some for the court and some for individual judges, trying to explain a theory of when the court, the state court of appeals should follow the Supreme Court and when it was free to or ought to depart. And uh, you know, in the 80s, pretty much this was going on. And um, each ju each judge, I think maybe every judge who was on the Court of Appeals at a, at a particular moment in the 80s wrote their own little, they were overlapping, but they each wrote their own little um, treatise on when it's appropriate to, f when, when you're obliged to follow the Supreme Court of the United States and when it's appropriate to depart. And that was the state of the law. I, maybe I should stop at this point. Well, but let me I, let me <laughs> add to what Bob was saying that that I don't think we've developed the methodology as to how you do that or when you do that. Um, you know, in in Scott and Keita. Well, I mean, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, we'll K, get that. You know, concurrence. I, yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. Basically, yeah. says. It's just got to be wise and independent judgment to protect individual liberties. And Judge Bellicosa went crazy. Yes, well, and, she didn't uh, quite say that. She did something I think was more admirable. She said, we do need principles here, but they, and, and that is important, about, but they shouldn't be rigid. They have to evolve with the facts. The test for that concurrence <laughs> as not developing a methodology, but I don't think you have to. My, my well, I know you don't, but I think she thought you did, <laughs> but that it but could she wasn't be able to articulate it. Well, she said all these principles about a special state interest and so forth were relevant, but at you, but you're right. At the end of the day, you still have to simply decide and, and, what justice and, and, is. And, and I give her credit for that's exactly oh, I, the I contrast that I want to make between. Um, her and Frankfurter on the one hand, who seemed to me to be right. rigidly adhering to right. principles, and Douglas on the other hand, who seemed to be willing to discard principles altogether. I think she did, she wrestled with structure and principles, yes. but didn't make them handcuffs. You, know? so you so, two have gotten a bit ahead of the context <laughs> for the audience, and I'll, I'll try and catch us up. But before I do that, um, Troy, Troy I, do I, you see 
Frankfurterian restraint as simply a national government concept. So, so I, I just I, I, I'm going to invoke my uh, colleague Helen Hirschkoff for a moment, and if you haven't read it, everyone in this room should read an article she published in the Harvard Law Review in 2001 called State Courts and the Passive Virtues, Rethinking the Judicial Function. And it walks through the traditional Frankfurterian, Bekelian arguments for why courts should be restrained, why courts should be very cautious, why courts should, for example, um, use procedural routes to avoid a constitutional question, standing doctrines, on and on and on. The, 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 stand, the, the standard toolkit that we think of when we think of uh, Thayer, Frankfurt, or Bickle, um, uh, not jumping in and grabbing questions, staying away from, from them, really truly being restrained. And one of the things that Professor Hirschkoff points out is those arguments make a lot of sense when you're talking about the federal courts, which are appointed, they are not elected, they are insulated in many ways, including good behavior tenure, compensation that can't be diminished. They truly are in a position that is uh, wrapped inside of many layers of bubble wrap. And it's a problem if those courts end up getting the bit between their teeth. That is not true for most state courts. Every summer at NYU, we have a, a seminar for new appellate judges, both federal circuit judges, judges of the state high courts, and state intermediate judges. The vast majority of the judges who show up are elected, or if they are not in a current elected position, have gotten to a place in their judiciary where they had to be elected at some point. So the arguments about unelected judges and the like doesn't really work when you start thinking about the state courts. As, as, as Barbara Underwood said, the the structural separation of powers within the state courts doesn't work the same way as it would in the federal courts. So you start thinking through the arguments and there is an institutional question about judicial competence, about um, other, other parts of the government having better knowledge, better ability to act, to think about a problem and resolve it in a way that doesn't tie things down forever. But um, it really is almost a, a categorical mistake to import one for one Frankfurterian arguments into the state courts because those arguments are great for the federal courts. They don't necessarily sit on all fours with the structure and role of the state courts. And one final thing, remember a state like New York, for example, has a state constitution that has positive rights, positive rights, shelter, um, lots of other things, education, you, it, you can you can maybe try to squeeze it out of the federal constitution, but as we all know, that's very hard to do. But let me just add to that, that there's nothing that says that the New York courts or the high court has to be in lockstep, uniform with the federal Supreme Court. It's just that they're not less political than we are. There's no basis for it in my mind, yes, you could take the view, as PJ Video uh, did, that you need some non-interpretive uh, uh, analysis to justify it. Or you know what? You could just disagree with what, what the Supreme Court did based on an independent analysis of the state constitution, even if the words are exactly the same. And, and that's state constitutionalism. And that's why the Frankfurter uh, uh, protocol doesn't really apply to this. And, and, and that's where we are, and that's why state constitutionalism is so powerful, particularly today when we're looking for places that I'm looking anyway, help everyone else is, that can be bastions of individual liberties and protection for our citizens. And John, I promised that I said the last thing before I lied. Um, just one, one final thing on this. I remember back in law school, I had Andy Schaefer uh, as my criminal procedure professor, and we read Michigan against Long. For, for those who aren't familiar, that is the case where the US Supreme Court said, when a state court does not make clear that is, it is deciding a constitutional question on grounds of its own constitution versus on grounds of the federal constitution, the US Supreme Court will 
will basically kind of assume that it is the federal constitution that has provided the grounds and therefore will have the ability to review and reverse the state court. That was a Fourth Amendment case. Um, but the Supreme Court also says, you know, the state courts can make it very clear. We're doing this under our own constitution versus the federal constitution and therefore insulate their decision from further judicial review. And I remember Andy Schaefer asking us, how could it be that a state, for example, New York, other states that have constitutional provisions that are almost word for word, sometimes right. exactly word for word with rights in the federal constitution, what principled ground would there be for interpreting those in different ways? And it struck me at the time, and I loved Andy Schaefer, as a completely naive question. Because what judges do is not just uh, textual analysis. Judges are applying the law. And the law is both text, history, structure, policy, good judgment, precedent. It's a lot of other things going on there. So there's nothing unprincipled or, strain or strange about a state court saying, even though we have identical texts, different contexts and different approaches are justified in a particular case. I didn't answer what that particular case is because I don't know. Troy, but let me give you an example of exactly what, what you're talking about. And a case called Weaver that had to do with the GPS uh, under a car, whether you needed a warrant, if you had a, a suspicion of some kind of criminal activity. And what I did in writing the majority decision for the three, in the New York State the, uh, Court of Appeals, said analyze the federal precedents and said, oh, it's not totally 100% clear, but here's what it is. And then said independently, I'm going to analyze the New York precedents. And in essence, was saying, so they can't appeal the decision that we're going to make. But lo and behold, the Supreme Court basically affirmed the same case nine to nothing. And so the mayor uh, uh, quoted my decision in that case, exactly the situation that you're talking about. You analyze both say, but this is under the state constitution. You can't review this, um, you know, and, and uh, it's such an interesting dynamic. Yeah, Chief, I always wondered if, in a sense, Weaver was frustrating because the whole point of independent state constitutionalism is to do more and then the U.S. Supreme Court just falls in line yeah. and follows the New York Court of Appeals. It was very interesting. Um, the Weaver they retreat. And, and then retreat at times. <laughs> um, we're talking about some specific cases. So to add particulars and, and catch up and, and push on this question of is there a standard here or is there any constraint here? Um, the Weaver case that Chief Judge Lipman mentioned is about the GPS tracking device, I reread you, and it's called a cue ball, uh, outmoded nickname. Um, there are chop shop cases, in effect, auto inspection cases, where the Supreme Court said the Fourth Amendment doesn't impose particular requirements on these administrative procedures. And then the New York Court of Appeals went higher, if you will, in the Keita case. Um, there's the Scott case, which is about the open fields doctrine and the New York Court of Appeals going higher. And that's where Kay and Bellicosa went at each other over the, the rationale issue on methodology. So we're talking about giants. We're talking about reflective, careful, reasoning people. But are we talking about anything other than the individual judgment? Is there some standard here that... A, a New York Court of Appeals judge is constrained by when using the same text that the federal constitution has, but going higher in interpreting it to do more for the individual. Could I? Sure. Barbara, okay. please. So I litigated the Keita case in please. its various forms. Um, um, the question in that case was whether the police could conduct warrantless inspections of vehicle dismantler shops, that's chop shops. Um, there was a statute that authorized these warrantless inspections. Chop shops are full of stolen cars. That's basically the, there. they could also have non-stolen cars, but they're a, a, a fertile place to look for stolen cars. Um, and in 1986, there was a statute that authorized warrantless inspections of these places. And in 1986, the New York Court of Appeals held that such an inspection violates the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution and didn't reach the state question 
I always thought that was an interesting and odd choice of the New York Court of Appeals to rule on federal constitutional grounds where they could be reviewed rather than on state constitutional grounds where they couldn't. But that's what they did. The Supreme Court reversed, saying this was a valid administrative regulatory scheme. So the case went back to the New York Court of Appeals for the state question, but by that time, that defendant was a fugitive, and so the case ended. <laughs> um, however, eventually, the same lawyer who was the lawyer to all these chop shops um, brought another case and raised the state constitutional question, and that case went to the Court of Appeals. Um, and by that time, there was already this huge, very large array of opinions about the question when the state court of appeals should follow the federal, the Supreme Court. And it wasn't just follow the Supreme Court in general. It was actually follow the Supreme Court about this very statute, because this very statute is what had gone up. And the New York Court of Appeals had said it violates the federal constitution, and the Supreme Court said, no, it doesn't. And so... Now the question is, does it violate the state constitution? We know the Court of Appeals hates this statute. They already held that it violates the federal constitution. Do they need to say anything more than we disagree? Exactly. They had already said they did. I agree with you that it's not perfectly clear that they should have to explain a departure. But there was this big body of opinions that said, you need a theory. And there's something to at least requiring that you pay attention to, you know, why you're doing something different, because why should the same words mean something different? Well, they might, but it seems worth explaining a reason. And if you can say more than just, I disagree, do, that would be good. Do you need a non-interpretive analysis, or can you just say, I disagree? Well, that that's the dispute, but the court had <laughs> already agree. the court had already said right. you need an explanation, and so um, the, what Judith Kay therefore had to do was grapple with that. Yes, and she said, "Well, I actually think that these this case is a little different from some of the other." Pre she she made an attempt to grapple with it. She anguished appropriately, I would say. Barbara, but she was taken to task for it. But people said she didn't really give a reason. I understand that she was taken. I thought that what I guess what I keep trying to say is that she did to what to my mind was the right middle ground thing yeah, to do. The principle, though. which, which is. Pay attention to the principles, see what you can say about them, feel somewhat constrained by them. But if at the end of the day, you're convinced that you should go the other way, explain what you've done to the best of your ability and feel free to do it. Don't be frankfurter and say, even though I think this wreaks a terrible injustice, I have my hands are tied. So I, I, can I just say about this very briefly? I, I think um, Brandeis has a role here too. Um, Judge Jeff Sutton of the Sixth Circuit has written a very interesting book called 51 Imperfect Solutions. Uh, he teaches about the role of the state constitutions. He was the Solicitor General of Ohio before uh, he went into private practice and then went on to the... the he litigated uh, Bernie, I think. And litigated yeah. Bernie, yeah. actually. Um, but what, what I found fascinating about his approach is the book contains examples where state courts reviewing questions, uh, rights questions, came up with a variety of answers, and then the US Supreme Court came in, took a different approach that history now disagrees with. Um, you know, the classic um, example um, uh, that he gives is some of the lower courts dealing with um, cases involving mandatory sterilization. Buck which Bell. which which then goes to the Supreme Court as Buck versus Bell. The Supreme Court says no problem uh, under under the Constitution, and then all the states court, courts kind of retreat and give up their that that conversation. So just but I, I want to throw in that there is a value, an independent value of state courts sometimes saying we're just we're going to do something different here to add to a conversation that that can develop across jurisdictions and then maybe up to the U.S. Supreme Court as well. There's an independent value in having a separate voice 
in that conversation. And it's something that Frankfurter definitely believed in. Well, you know, John raised an interesting issue earlier today by raising a case called De Boer. Yes. The case in New York that you're familiar with that, Judge Zabarak? Yes. Um, where they they basically, the state court did what they, it was a stop case, whether you could stop someone in the street, ask, inquire, arrest, whatever. New York made it very complicated, four different levels of things that you could do, depending on the information that you had. While the federal courts, Supreme Court had a test basically of reasonable suspicion. And what John pointed out was, in this De Boer case, the state Supreme Court did not, the state court of appeals did not mention a thing known as the state constitution. So, on what grounds did they possibly decide De Boer? And a few years later, in Holman, they translated and said, "No, no, it was the state it's the common law and the state constitution." Even though they didn't mention the state constitution, so it goes to this whole issue of. Do you have to say why and how, how, or you could just say, we don't care why, here's what it is. Right. I, I like Barbara's description of Chief Judge Kay and the effort to explain the effort to do, uh, or to yes. agonize, I think was your word, uh, even if the critics aren't all going to be satisfied at the end. I want to call Professor Snyder in to comment on some of this. Yeah, I just, um, I don't have a dog in the fight of state versus federal courts. You all are the experts on that. But but I keep hearing the same sort of language. Well, we just need to do justice and we just need a theory. And and my observation is that the right on the last 25 years has worked on theory, right? They've developed two ideas, textualism, in interpreting statutes and in, an originalism in interpreting the constitution that for those 25 years the left decided to play what does justice kennedy think on this constitutional issue and that's not a theory that's a tactic so i i, I think um you know i think that thinking about theory and, and i don't think doing justice is a theory either Right. Because um, do as we see from the current Supreme Court, different people have different ideas about what doing justice is. Right. And so that's why I think maybe Frankfurter went too far with his theory on certain occasions. I argued in my book he shouldn't have even been sitting on the Japanese internment cases, given that he was, you know, advice giving too much department. advice um, to, to the War Department. Um, but. But we need a theory, and that's where I think. But isn't well, originalism and textualism and all that stuff? Isn't that just an excuse to do what you want? I, I don't think so. No, I, I think you can have a debate about. Um, you know, there are different ways of doing originalism, and there's different ways of doing um, well, textualism, that, and at least gives you a kind of playing field. It, it um, gives and, you a foundation for what you're doing, but in effect, it's like the issue of activism. Is is when you use originalism, are you being an activist judge or the opposite? Well, I, I did. I think originalism. You can argue over over history, and you can argue about text. And, and I think there are good um, textual arguments, and there are um, good historical arguments, and there are bad or less persuasive. Um, textual arguments and less persuasive historical arguments at least gives you some tools to fight about these things and i i think that's why better than when you're just saying i'm doing justice yeah is that your and point? i i think that's where More persuasive may be to somebody who isn't sure they agree with you right and i, and I think well, for someone that's trying to argue in front of you maybe you have a sense of <laughs> what you may I, decide it on you know I think that's where Justices Frankfurter and Hugo Black, who had a really strong theory, a different one um, than Frankfurter, but one with the same goal, which was trying to constrain the justices on the Supreme Court, um, mostly grounded on text um, and mostly grounded, you know, on a strong sense of history, a, a total incorporation theory of the first um, eight amendments of the Constitution into the 14th. And I think he was um, right on that. Um, but, but he was Frankfurter was not into these uh, a neutral, interpretive uh, ways that you you read the cut. Was he or was he? Well, I don't think that he would have signed on to Herbert Wexler's neutral principles um, article in full. He had a different um, philosophy. But I think thinking about theory is really important because if you don't think about what theory um, the judges are deciding, either a statutory case or a constitutional 
case, then it just be becomes judges looking like super legislators and might just makes right. And that's um, when people. Well, Frankfurt is against that. that. that I was that trying to get at earlier when I talked about earning some respect as an as an arbiter of disputes doing something different from what the legislature right because i don't think we want nine politicians in robes or six politicians in robes or or, or seven or however many ju judges or justices there are on a particular state court i'm thinking about you know wisconsin you know you, you don't want that right and, that, and that's the role i think theory can play in helping understand how judges arrived at their decision and and that's where i think doing justice gave people like learned hand and felix frankfurter some pause. Well, also, you need a theory because judges are not good on policy, was Frankfurt's view, right? They're not experts as legislators are. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he believed in the legislature. Like, he was a, I mean, the way I would describe Frankfurter to um, lawyers is he was a McCullough constitutionalist. He thinks that the Constitution gave the federal government broad implied powers and that most of the time um, the Supreme Court of the United States should get out of the way. And that's the complete 180 from the current situation at the Supreme Court of the United States um, where every federal law is inherently suspect. Let me pick up on yeah. Troy's mention of Judge Jeff Sutton's book, 51 uh, Courts. Um, goes to the imperfect the, solutions right goes goes to the sort of number of spectators and power centers that are out there uh in the states vis-a-vis -vis the u.s supreme court is it appropriate for state court judges to be um watching the court and watching a pendulum swing and come to a conclusion that now is the time for us to step up that maybe this is a Taylor Swift er reference. This era um, is the moment for more state constitutionalism as opposed to a time when the U.S. Supreme Court was better. Is that a relevant consideration? for? State I, I think judges? it's the real world. I think that that if if your view and everyone has a different view, there are all these different states in the United States and different state high courts and we'd meet them all you know, at these meetings of the chief uh, uh, judges of the high court, very different views in terms of what, you know, high courts should be doing, you know, or not doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, you know, if, 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 you, if you're sitting on the high court and you think, gee, you know, in New York, the, the federal courts are not protecting people's rights. The Supreme Court of the United States are not protecting people's rights. Um, and you're looking at a state constitution that gives you ability to protect those rights. That isn't that the real world? Don't you think that is what happens in either direction? Either it's a liberal high court and you say, oh, I want conservative principles, or the opposite, but particularly where you feel that the state constitution is a source of additional protections for your citizens. I think that is the world. Is it right? I mean, that's a, a judge. Well, at, at its worst, if if it gets too confrontational, the Supreme Court will come in and say that what the state court is doing to protect some people's rights is violating some other people's rights and is therefore unconstitutional. If you do it totally on the state constitution, remember we've no, it's a... I don't know. I'm not saying they are wrong. No, you you can't avoid this problem. That is, if you give people a, you go too far. If you yeah. give people a First yeah. Amendment right that yes. fringes on yes. somebody else's religion, religion, right. or you give people a, um, a a right to shelter that infringes that that amounts to a takings in the view of the. Of, of of the Supreme Court, then no the direct traffic. Then, 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 right. So this the the Supreme Court will have the last word if it comes in that, to that way. Yes. If it comes to yes. that, yes. Yes. yes, yes. So I I guess therefore to translate that into a strategic consideration, I would be inclined to recommend avoiding being too directly confrontational, or you invite that response. <laughs> I I think that's good. Strategy, Bob. Very good. Right. So I, I uh, because I teach or <laughs> used to before I took on this job, uh, I used to teach civil procedure. I think of Frankfurter's opinion uh, in Guarantee Trust, uh, 
one of the uh, canonical cases in the line of Supreme Court decisions forming the Erie Doctrine. And in some ways, it's a strange opinion. The language is Frankfurterian in that you read it and you think this is not someone for whom English was his first language when you read the opinion. <laughs> Uh, and the word outlawry, the outlawry of a cause of action, <laughs> not, not not sort of doesn't trip off the tongue. But when I teach it to students, I, I, I explain to them that the brute force approach that he took in that case, essentially saying, I don't really care how you might theoretically classify something as substance or procedure. Um, basically, I care about whether it affects, it determines the outcome of the of the of the case and if it does then you go with what the state courts have said it really does open up in in the non-constitutional realm a role for state courts in the development of state law to then control even when a matter falls into the lap of a federal court on diversity or supplemental jurisdiction um so as we're thinking through the constitutional the, the great questions I just want to put on the table that Frankfurter was also thinking about what you might call the day-to-day, -day, the, the blue-collar questions that come before courts all the time. The contract dispute, the slip and fall case that has that happens to have a, uh, uh, a mountain controversy great enough that it ends up in the federal courts and wanted to draw pretty strict lines to keep the federal courts constrained and allow the state courts as frankly, policymakers and law announcers to have a greater role in the determination of, of, uh, of those matters. As part of bringing this home, let me turn to Professor Snyder. I know this is a biography, not a Ouija board, but <laughs> what would Frankfurter make of this moment, us, this conversation and the judging that we're discussing as it's done in both federal and state courts? That's a huge question. I mean. I think what would dismay him is just how easily the Supreme Court of the United States tosses aside federal laws, right? I just, I, I think the, I think the one that would truly outrage him is just sort of the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act, kind of piece by piece by piece, but by this court, I, I don't think he would recognize um, what the court is doing as a proper form of judicial review. Right. He would have seen uh, the, the Voting Rights Act as, you know, squarely within, um, const, you know, the Congress's power. Um, he thought that Congress um, had ample power under the Reconstruction Amendments um, to enforce them. And, and I, I think he'd be truly outraged by that. So, you know, uh, the other thing I just think pe the question people ask me all the time is, well, how would he have come out in Dobbs? <laughs> Right. You know, th that's the one question I get. Everyone's about. claiming him, Brad. They're all claiming him. Right. For... <laughs> you know, and so you have the right saying, well, you know, Frankfurt, you know, hated the due process clause. So, um, of course, he would have um, come out with the majority in Dobbs. I really don't think so. Right. I, I think um, he was loath um, to overturn the court's precedents. Um, he saw um uh, the court's precedence as a way uh, of serving as a break on judicial power. And I just can't see him overturning um, a 50 year old precedent or maybe two. Right. It's I can't... easier to say he might wouldn't have joined Roe than to say he exactly. would have joined you know, Roe. Maybe, you know, maybe yeah. I, it's, it's I, mean, I don't know what he yeah, would have done it's, with it's Roe. Really, it's a it's different really question. hard to say. Yeah. Right. I mean, this was a justice. Um, who um, wrote the case that said a state could have a law banning women um, as bartenders. Um, this was a justice who had never taught a woman student um, at um, Harvard Law School and declined to have um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's um, staring at me up from the wall as a, as a law clerk, um, right? Really he, he worked with all sorts of women lawyers throughout his career, but like um, the rest of his all-male Warren Court colleagues, um, they were all bad. Um, on women's rights. And that goes um, from Earl Warren all the way uh, to William O. Douglas. And so it's hard for me to kind of um, go from 62 um, to 73 um, because um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, had he been before her as an advocate, <laughs> right, um, he, he may have 
um, persuaded her that the Equal Protection Clause protected um, the equal citizenship of women um, in the same way that it protected um, the equal citizenship of Black people. That's um, sort of an unknowable. But I do know in 2023, I can't see him knocking down Supreme Court precedents um, like bowling pins um, to overturn um, the right to an abortion. Uh, that that I can't see. Um, on the eight, the human eight ball, um, 1973 is too unclear for me. <laughs> Uh, final words, Dean McKenzie. Uh, so I, again, I, I, I want to commend to everyone this biography. It, it does something that we haven't talked about, which is it does serve as a um, corrective to what I talked about as the the standard version of, of uh, how Frankfurter is seen in terms of his reputation. But it does something else. It also corrects a... The, the last major work on Frankfurter from the 1980s by by Hirsch, um, who sort of treated Frankfurter as a, quote, neurotic personality with an idealized and inflated self-image. It was a kind of psychological portrait of Frankfurter. And although judicial psychology is interesting, I think it's much more persuasive to dig in and see the complexities and contradictions and surprises of someone who is so smart and so dedicated and such a patriot. Um, uh, as someone who is an immigrant to this country, reading about Frankfurter's love of the country and how he saw the United States really is moving. Um, and you think to yourself, really only in America could someone come fresh off a boat, not speaking a word of English at you know age 13 or 14, and uh, within a generation be a professor at Harvard Law School and then a member of the Supreme Court of the United States and sufficiently important that a group of the great and the good would be gathered together in New York City in 2023 talking about him. Bravo. <laughs> Chief Judge Libman. Well, I also want to thank Brad that uh, from the judging point of view, I think uh, um, getting into his philosophy and uh, all of the contradictions really that are inherent in, in that stated philosophy, and yet you read some of the cases, and they just, he, he's, he's in a lot of different places that relate to this modern world that we live in. And what it made me think about, and I think is, is really, at least for me, really helpful in terms of the art of judging, that we do get lost. I think the question that maybe John had raised with, is it liberal or conservative, what they're doing, and how do you, what's the antidote to that? Is it what Frankfurter espoused, or is it the opposite? And I think what it makes you think about is, is what does it mean to be a judge in our society today? What does the, uh, um, how does it, do you make the constitution the federal and the state, for that matter, alive in today's world, and and you know what's what's the end game here? What's the, I always looked at, and I and I still do, that the courts are the ultimate uh, um, uh, a demonstration of what a, a tripartite system of government is: checks and balances, and all those things but it cuts in almost every different direction. When you look again, I still feel that way, that, that, that the, the thing that separates us, and you look at the dialogue today, the political dialogue is overblown, you know, in, in every direction. But I do feel that the courts are what separates us from every other country in the world, or, or most countries in the world, the difference between us and dictatorships, so I think it makes you think about all those things and what his theory does it play today. Is this reappraisal of Frankfurter exactly what we should be doing? This makes, makes us think of the issue in general and where we are and what the judiciary means in this country today. Bravo. Solicitor General Underwood. I think it's all been said. I think this has been a wonderful examination of an interest re-examination of an interesting man and judge and i for one would like to know something about this new generation of scholarship that is going in a different direction because um i hadn't even thought about the fact that this isn't just one book and one man but a uh, um there's a gestalt there's a something going on in the 
go in, back to in academia. The world. Yeah. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, thank you very much for bringing us all together for this wonderful conversation. This is a small story, if you'll indulge me. I hope some of you were able to enjoy the buffet dinner right here in the building that preceded the program. It was open to all members. Each was invited to bring a guest. It cost only $3, and that included not only the dinner, but cocktails. I doubt that very many of you got to enjoy that occasion. If you did, you're now at least 90 years old, probably much <laughs> more than that. I'm referring to the Association of the Bar of the City of New York dinner that preceded Justice Frankfurter's delivery of the sixth annual Cardozo lecture from this dais regarding statutory interpretation on March 18, 1947. I also missed the dinner. Uh, but tonight we all did enjoy a program that arguably is more enduring. It was substance that has endured and that is timeless from Justice Frankfurter, from his biographer and from these experts that was our program tonight. I hope that will it will inform and perhaps influence how each of us goes forth to lawyer, to teach, to judge, and if I may coin a new term, to democratically citizen. This program and these ideas, discussion, debate, surely would please Frankfurter, who was ever the teacher. And that's a claim I can prove because in March, 1947, Frankfurter dictated a letter just before he jumped on the train from Washington to come up here to deliver the Cardozo lecture. It was to Louis Jaffe, his former student, a protege, Jaffe then was a professor at the University of Buffalo Law School, and Frankfurter was sending comments on a book review that Jaffe had just written about a book, a biography of Louis Brandeis. And in the review, Jaffe took issue with the claim that Brandeis had been a judicial activist. And Frankfurter, a Brandeis acolyte and intimate friend, wrote to Jaffe that this comment was as true as it is good. And then he added a rhetorical question, which I'll read and I encourage you to ponder. This is Frankfurter. Is it my preoccupation with my own job, which makes me wonder why those of the legal professoriate who know better are doing so little of this sort of elucidation and are leaving the field largely to those who really think that law is only the manipulation of symbols for immediate predetermined ends. What Brad Snyder has done in the book and in this program that he's inspired is be a person in the legal professoriate who's doing this sort of elucidation. And that's exactly what Felix wanted. So please join me in thanking Hank Greenberg, Troy McKenzie, Jonathan Lipman, Barbara Underwood, and Brad Snyder. Thank God.